Good evening and a very warm welcome to all of you to this third and final Interfaith Dialogue on Laudato Si. I would like to introduce Reverend Gladys G. Moore of St. John's Lutheran Church. I have to say this is the first encyclical I have ever read and I'm glad I picked a good one. I read it completely and I am so glad that I did because it's beautifully written. Um, I mean, there were times in which it brought me to tears because of the power of the words themselves. And I was profoundly moved both by uh, Pope Francis's clarity and by his ability to name our common problems in order to promote the common good. He talked about throwaway culture. That so resonates as we think about not only our environment and all that we dispose of, but the people that we can so readily throw away. He talked about rampant consumerism, about the lack of political will to change, about our lack of corporate and communal responsibility, and all of those things spoke to me. But I was also touched by his hopefulness and pointing to what it is that we can do. So it caused me, as I read this, to do some serious self-reflection and to begin to make simple changes in my own lifestyle. I just returned from vacation. I spent a week on Deer Isle in Maine, have gone there every year for 30 years. And part of the reason why I go to Maine is because of the beauty of creation. Mountains and rivers and clean air and stars that you can see at night, unhindered by buildings. It is a spectacular uh, part of God's creation. This was part of my self-examination. He says, a person who could afford to spend and consume more but regularly uses less heating and wears warmer clothes, shows the kinds of convictions and attitudes which help to protect the environment. There is a nobility in the duty to care for creation through little daily actions. And it is wonderful how education can bring about real changes in lifestyle. Education and environmental responsibility can encourage ways of acting which directly and significantly affect the world around us, such as avoiding the use of plastic and paper, reducing water consumption, separating refuse, cooking only what can be reasonably consumed, showing care for other living beings, using public transport. All of these reflect a generous and worthy creativity which brings out the best in being human. The friends that I vacationed with do this. They uh, use well water. They wash out those plastic Ziploc bags. My mother used to do that 30 years ago, just like she washed plastic forks and spoons. And I would say to her, Mom, it's plastic. It's supposed to be thrown away. My friends today still do that. They wash out plastic bags. How many of you do that? God bless you. This is good inspiration because I still think it's plastic and it's meant to be disposed of. But of course, that's what's making the landfills so bad. So there are simple things that we can do to really help with the environment. But it really pierced me to the heart because for Lutherans, at least for this one, coffee is the third sacrament. And I drink it <laughs> daily, multiple cups a day. And because those Keurig coffee pots make things so convenient, I have really become enamored with them. And I have one at the house, and I have one in the office. And of course, you know, Keurig stock has gone down because those little plastic pods are not um, renewable and they are just filling landfills because of their plastic. And so I feel convicted, convicted. And I went out and 
got a four-cup coffee pot. <laughs> Thank you, Pope Francis. Little things, but we can change, and those little changes add up, especially if all of us do them. So I am so grateful for the opportunity to reflect on my own behavior and on our corporate behavior. But Pope Francis's comments about the Rio Summit in 92 and the Rio 20 uh, Summit in, in 2012 also made clear that there is a lack of accountability and our need to hold our legislators accountable and responsible for caring for creation. Frankly, I don't particularly like politics, but it is absolutely essential that we be both citizens of heaven as well as citizens of the earth. And in our time and in our country, it is critical for people of faith and people of conscience and goodwill to have a voice in the public sphere because that's how we really are going to make changes. Four months ago, my first grandchild was born and Pope Francis asks us, what kind of legacy do we want to leave the next generation? I want this world to be a place where little Elliot can grow up with clean air and beautiful stars and peace in his day. Thanks. I'd like to turn to these excerpts quickly and I'll read one and then ask that we all together read 202. So the one I'd like to read is 180 because I love the personal touch with that the Pope as teacher will uh, engage in from time to time in the encyclical. New forms of cooperation and community organization can be encouraged in order to defend the interests of small producers and preserve local ecosystems from destruction. Truly, much can be done. And then 202, let's read that together. It's beautiful phrases. Many things have to change course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. We lack an awareness of our common origin, of our mutual belonging, and of a future to be shared with everyone. A great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us, and it will demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. I'd like to welcome back Rabbi Avi Friedman. Is Avi there? Yes. First of all, I again want to thank Susan for organizing these three sessions. They've been phenomenal. I unfortunately missed the first one, but numbers two and three are fantastic. Thank you to St. Teresa's for uh, hosting this third session. It uh, was a last second uh, change, and uh, it's always good to change a little bit, so thank you. Um, so you couldn't have known what uh, I was going to talk about, but that last reading that we all did together is the perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about. So uh, as I was thinking about uh, the fifth and sixth se sections of this uh, remarkable document, right, the forward-looking sections, the, the challenge sections of this uh, remarkable document, um, I was reminded of uh, a lesson that... I was a part of in rabbinical school um, where one of my instructors asked all of us to close our eyes and think about the meat section of a grocery store. You don't have to close your eyes, but think about the meat section of a grocery store. I'm sorry if you're a vegetarian, but you're probably even more attuned to this than, uh, than meat eaters because there's absolutely no sign whatsoever that that meat came from an animal. The whole point of the meat section is to divorce that product from its origin, right? You won't see a picture of a cow. You won't see a picture of a chicken, right? Uh, many of the cuts have different names that are different from the actual animal from which they come, right? They're wrapped in these 
you know, pristine white uh, board containers with beautiful cellophane, right? So that uh, it no longer has the shape of an animal. It's just this clean looking package. You can't smell it. It's so far from the origin that you may as well, you know, not know where it came from. And in a nutshell, that's our problem. And I think that Pope Francis touches on it. We are so far removed from the processes that provide us food, that bring water to our homes, that bring electricity to our homes, that provide us shelter and warmth, that we have forgotten the impact that they have on the earth that God has given us. And I think that the challenge that Pope Francis has given us, and that, you know, in a perfect world we would have noticed on our own without him uh, kicking us you know where, is that we have to reconnect with those processes, right? We have to go back to the source. I don't have the text in front of me that, uh, that we just read, but we have to get back to that connection to the earth. And so from a Jewish perspective, I was reminded of two basic prayers. Many Jews know them by heart. Um, it's the prayer before we eat and the prayer after we eat. And uh, many of us have traditions of praying before and after we eat. It's no surprise we give thanks to God for sustenance. In the Jewish tradition, though, uh, the prayer before we eat, we give thanks to God, and there's a standard formula that we use. In Hebrew, it's Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Praised Are You Adonai, Power of the Universe. And then we say, Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz, who brings forth bread from the earth, right? We should never take it for granted that our most basic food, bread, right, is brought out from the earth. But it's not brought out directly, right? You can't go to a bread tree, though some of our kids or grandchildren might think so, right? You, you know, we can go to the equivalent of a bread tree, right? Kings, right? Or shop, right? Right? And just pluck a bread off the shelf. But there's a lot of work that goes into producing a, even just a simple piece of bread. So that blessing, which we acknowledge God's greatness, we also have to acknowledge our partnership with the land. And that's something that we should all be doing whenever we approach food, especially in our world where uh, we are so divorced from it that we can waste food at unbelievable rates and, and not even bat an eyelash because we have no concept of how hard it was to produce that bit of food. So that's the first prayer that we say. And then when uh, we are done eating, there's a very long prayer, but one of the main passages, one of the original passages is a quote from the Bible that may be familiar to many of you, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, verse 10. When you have eaten and you are satisfied, you will bless the land which the Lord your God has given you. Right? Not bless God, bless the land that the Lord your God has given you. So we should never take for granted this connection that we have. And sadly, that's where we are as modern Americans. Uh, and I know I keep repeating it, but we have to reestablish that link. We have to get back to the connection between humanity and the earth so that we can repair that which we have broken through our ignorance. And so I was reminded of a story which is preserved in our Talmud, a great collection of teachings. Uh, but which I know has been preserved in other traditions, and I'd be interested to hear if others of you have heard it in your traditions as well. And so uh, in the Jewish Talmudic version, uh, there's an old man uh, planting a fig tree in the land of Israel when a Roman soldier, not long after the destruction of the temple, came up to this Israelite Jewish man and said, old man, why are you planting a fig tree? It'll take at least 20 years for this tree to bear fruit, and you'll be long gone before this tree is even close to bearing fruit. And the old man respond, responded, when I was a child, I could eat fruit because people before me planted. Have I not the responsibility to do the same for future generations? So uh, let's all think about how we can uh, plant some fig trees. Thank you for coming out this evening.
We're delighted that Reverend Vernon Williams is here, and we look forward to your response to the encyclical. Good evening to everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Susan for inviting me to provide a response to the encyclical, and I would have to say that as a Baptist, uh, certainly this is my first encyclical uh, that I have read. <laughs> Uh, nonetheless, uh, what I've found uh, in reading the encyclical, especially in, in chapters 5 and 6, Pope Francis seems to give us a, a challenge uh, on a spiritual level that, uh, that we are to be reminded uh, that the Creator uh, made everyone uh, uh, and that uh, not only everyone but uh, uh, we are stewards of this planet that we have. One thing I am struck by Pope Francis's encyclical is that uh, he seems to uh, weigh the evidence of what has taken place with our world. Uh, in weighing the evidence, he has come to the conclusion that there is an issue. The evidence is there. It's not up in the air. And I think the encyclical seems to say to us that as, uh, as spiritual beings, we need to be able to, uh, uh, with our minds, be able to think uh, and move beyond the propaganda uh, that has been uh, uh, so well uh, postulated out there. Um, and so what I really appreciate uh, is that he, he not only, uh, uh, Pope Francis not only connects uh, uh, that there is global uh, uh, issues in terms of climate, but that it is dependent also on the humanity in terms of those who are less fortunate, and that there is an interconnection there. Not only uh, does he challenge us on a uh, personal level, but he also challenges those of us in the clergy on a spiritual level uh, to say to us that we need to begin to educate our people. We need to be able to provide uh, the evidence for them uh, because uh, as a body, yes, can we do it? Of course we can. However, if you don't come to the conclusion of Pope Francis that there is an issue, you will not do anything. And so I would submit that perhaps Pope Francis is, is, is uh, sort of trying to say to us, you have to first come to the conclusion that there really is a problem. Um, you know, someone, you know, we talked about World War II, it was evident what the problem was. It was evident what the issue was. And then therefore, as a people, we galvanized. And so now, uh, we, we need to, perhaps as clergy, need to start to come into uh, uh, this issue from the standpoint of we need to begin to provide better education uh, for our people to begin to challenge them uh, and ourselves on an individual level so that collectively we can actually make uh, a big difference. And so that, that's one of the, that's the thing that has really struck me most is that how much clarity Pope Francis has that there is an issue and then knowing the, the, the gravity of the issue spiritually, he's moved to do something. So I think that's what we need to get, and that's clergy, that's what we need to help our people to get. Thank you. Thank you to all. Angela has set out some cookies. There's no plastic water bottles. There are plastic, plastic cups that I'm gonna take home and wash. And there are pitchers of water, so you're all invited to partake. Thank you so much. Thank you.